All right, we are live for our second installment of a Lunch and Learn regarding the Behavioral Elements Program. I am joined today by Terry Bean, and if you're not connected to Terry Bean on LinkedIn, you definitely should be. But today we are going to discuss the elements of love. How are you doing today, Terry? You know what, man? This topic is just in time, baby. Listen, some of us are probably going to screw up tomorrow pretty badly, and hopefully <laughs> we can mitigate that failure point through this conversation. For a couple of you, some of you are going to excel at it, I'm sure. Or maybe already screwed up, and now you have to dig your way out because, you know, it's never too early to screw up. So we've got a great group here. We want you to feel comfortable to put anything in the chat, join us in the dialogue from there, or put things into the questions and answers. But we'll get started with a couple of softballs here, Terry. If you were to, you know, it's interesting. I've done a lot of work with the Behavioral Elements Program and looking at things like fear. And it's really interesting finding some of the different uh, correlations between what our drivers are or what our core elements are and how fear ends up showing up for us. And no element owns one fear or anything else, but it's how they come to that fear that's super interesting. So I'm really interested, never had a conversation about love and the elements. I might be an unlikely character for this, but I am fascinated by the science. So Terry, tell me, what is, you know, tell us a little bit about what's your element. And, you know, if you were to give us that sort of large level overview on love, what are your thoughts? So I, my highest element is air, but my, and my water and earth aren't too terribly far, excuse me, my water and fire, my, my earth is it, like in the next county. Um, my water and fire aren't terribly far from it. Um, and then earth, as I mentioned, is virtually non-existent, which is why I was able to applaud your very earthly move of hitting the record button. That was a, that was very structured of you. Um, and as far as love goes, man, um, I'm absolutely fascinated by all types of it. I believe we spend way too much time talking about hate and haters and not nearly enough time talking about love and lovers and loving. I remember 15 years ago, I wanted to be known as the guy that was trying to bring love into the boardroom because I think we get so much more done there. Um, I am married, so I have the love of a lovely bride who puts up with my crap all the time. Um, I have, we have a daughter, and so uh, you didn't really know love until there was a child that kind of looked and acted like you. That was so next level, and I'm still blown away by that experience 21 plus years later. Uh, and then... You know, as far as the rest of it goes, I've experienced the the heartache and the heartbreak of being in love with the wrong person. Uh, I've experienced the heartache of not loving myself the way I should. Uh, and I've gone through enough lessons to realize that's where it needs to start, right, is you need to figure out what you absolutely love about you and self-care is a wonderful act of loving. So that's my initial dissertation on love. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't throw that same question back on you, Jay. You know, it's interesting. So as you, uh, as you were talking there, I definitely want to get into self-love at some point in time, because I think that that is something that a lot of people don't talk about or feel comfortable talking about. Uh, if you were to ask a number of my friends, they'd probably tell you that I actually do love myself quite a bit, um, but not in an arrogant way. I'm just a very, you know, happy and very happy with who I am. But, you know, my experience and, and thought from a love perspective, and I hate to go behavioral science on it, but I do think about the neurotransmitters and the chemicals that are at play, how we feel. And uh, one of the things that I have been really, really interested in, and this was actually brought to my attention in my travels to Europe, um, one of my colleagues from Estonia, Annie Oja, she is a linguist. 
And she talked to me a little bit about like how, say, Estonians utilize the word love. They they just don't. So whereas I'm like, oh, I, I love my dog and I love my espresso maker and I love being with people and working with people. That wouldn't actually occur in a number of other cultures, fascinatingly enough, because love is something that is so specific and so tight and so formed for the people in our lives, whether it's family, whether it's relationship partners, et cetera. So love has a different context and a different meaning across cultures, across people, and how we give and receive love is just a fascinating area for me. And in thinking about, you know, I was introduced to the love languages so, so long ago, and I didn't really honestly pay it much homage but in this last, uh, the last behavioral element certification training we were doing for a group, one of the people came up and said, have you done anything with love languages? I was like, I haven't, but this Tuesday, February 13th, in honor of Valentine's Day, we are taking this on. So I'm super excited to engage in this conversation. We definitely want to field any questions that you may have, but you know, one of the things that you brought up Terry and I'm going to uh, lean back into this because my earth is also categorically very low, but just because something's low in the behavioral elements doesn't mean that we're bad at it. It just means it takes more intention and thought and energy, et cetera. So with being so low in earth, how do you think about, uh, let's say, how do you think about when you're approaching a holiday such as Valentine's Day or even a partner or a child's birthday? Like, do you have a process or a system so you, A, don't forget, or B, that you manage those, you know, um, those events in a really positive way? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is so lame dude but or such a cop out i shouldn't use that word anymore uh but the 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 strategy is marry an earth person right my wife is <laughs> high earth i i i got engaged on valentine's day with the mindset that i set the bar so high for valentine's day that i don't ever have to compete with that and so i will uh i will be mindful of the fact that it's tomorrow i will do something special she's like literally within earshot so i can't get into that right now um and I will 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 figure out how to be nice and cute and romantic for a little bit. But there's I'm fortunate in that, um, you know, much like going out on New Year's Eve. Right. We don't we don't go out to the bar because it's amateur night going out on New Year's Eve, going out on Valentine's Day. She's like, what are we dumb? No, we're not trying to do that. And so I, I am lucky there. So she provides a lot of that structure. Now, the good news is I have a really good memory. So I end up being the one that says, hey, uh, you know, my sister's birthday is coming up in a couple of days or it's today. Right. So I'll do the reminding to put things in motion but yeah the rest of it is um i don't know that shoot i don't even know that i buy her christmas presents at this point because she just buys them and tells me what to wrap now and that stinks but it's it's kind of what it is man it's That's kind of what it is it is I used to I used to rely on technology, right? Like used to rely on either Facebook or rely on a calendar or some kind of notification that would give me that. But I realized that I would get the notifications that day. And it was really a, a question of did I log into it that day or did I look at that that day? So I tried a strategy at one point in time of trying to structure it by putting a notification like a week early. So that way I could either get a gift or anything else like that. But then I would get the notification and then completely forget about it and then be scrambling at the end anyways. So, I, you know, I'm still looking for that great structure. Uh, actually, one of our participants here is Terry and she can attest she did get a happy birthday message. It may have been the next day. And I even had that one marked. I was like, I'm going to I'm going to wish her a happy birthday. I knew that it was and I still managed to do that. So I'm still working on my earth element, really trying to develop that. And uh, thankfully, she was very gracious and forgave me. But 
Um, you know, when we think about, say, something like, uh, when we think about something like, and I'm, I'm curious, I'd be curious to see what the audience would have to say on this as well. When you think about maybe something like the love languages, Terry, you know, very popular, got a lot of popular, uh, uh, popular notification and notoriety in the public. Uh, you're an air element followed by that water. You know, do you have a particular, do you know what your love language is according to the love languages quiz? And how does that show up for you? So for me, I, I am a firm believer that I am an acts of service guy, right? And I'm a time and attention guy. And and so, you know, we, we had talked about this program that we were doing. We both took the love language assessment. You know, to be honest, that was a book that was on my mother's bookshelf after she got divorced back in like 1975, man. So I not to suggest that I read it at five years old. I did not. Uh, but it was always kind of around. So the acts of service in the in the time and attention thing to me is really important because I I you know, I go back and forth whether or not I truly value my time. Um, and, and I have some definitive proof that I do not. Uh, but I also know that, like, my greatest gift for people uh, is just showing up and being there for them. So, you know, we don't have to necessarily go out and do anything. We just hop in a car and go for a ride, right? Or, you know, I'll go and sit and we'll have conversation and we'll take that time. And, you know, I've, I've recently picked up doing laundry because, you know, for years I heard about how much laundry there is. There's so much laundry. There's so much laundry. Now, I conveniently waited until our daughter left the house to pick up the laundry task, but, you know, and for me, it was always a matter of, well, why would I do it? You're going to refold everything anyway. What difference does it make? So I'm not really helping. Um, she still refolds it, but she is very happy that that laundry is done. So it is an interesting thing. If you haven't taken the what's your love language and encouraged your partner to do so, um, it's an interesting piece because I realized we were missing for a while. And it was because I didn't understand what she was doing was her way of showing me love. And it would like almost like bug me. Right. And so once I found out that that's where she was coming from, you start reflecting on all the issues and all the items and all the times when you're like, oh, wow, this was a demonstration of love. I thought she was doing it just to tick me off. <laughs> <laughs> and so you cha it changes your perspective, right? And then and you can reframe how you change your behavior as a result. That's interesting. So, uh, you know, I think one of my top ones was words of affirmation, which kind of made sense when I started to think about it. And I think that acts of service was in that one or two, uh, top two or three. And I found it to be really interesting in, in sort of exploring like, all right, well, what does that mean for me? And a lot of times I think that I am very rational, logical, calculating, and practical when it comes to like affection. And when I am receiving something like, for example, and I think this is where the fire element really comes into play for me. Uh, I am very, 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 very much instant gratification. Like a gift that you get me that's like, hey, in eight months, you're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z is one of those where I'm like, awesome, that sounds great. And then like, I will not think about that per se. And I, I hate to admit this, but I'm not going to think about that for the next eight months until it's like the day of. I am so much more into real time, give me the result quickly. And I do think that that's very much associated with my fire element. Uh, which is also probably how I end up giving gifts too. Like it's going to be practical, it's going to be useful, and it's probably going to help you win something along the way. Like it really <laughs> takes a lot of energy for me to dig down deep and think about something like what's going to be really meaningful or what's going to have a sentimental value. Uh, do you ever have any kind of experience with, uh, do you ever have any kind of experience with sort of navigating some of that, Terry, of like, all right, 
uh, you have a high air element and that that water element. Is it are you looking for something creative? Are you looking for an experience? Are you looking for like where does that show up for you? You know, it's interesting. There was a there was a period of time like if you were getting married, you got the same gift as the people that I went to the last wedding. Right. So and there was a period of time long before that for Christmas, I got everybody the same thing, a keepsake that was going to be that they'd have for a very long time. So it would have some meaning. It would stick around. Um, but yeah, most of the time. Gift giving is, is, I'm always impressed with people that are so spot on with taking the time and the energy to really know the person and and find something that's uniquely them, right, and is so perfect. Um, but in the same breath, man, what was a uh, mutant ninja? No, mutants down under, mutant messenger down under, a book that was out 20 years ago. The, they went and toured with the aboriginals and 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 those folks believe that a gift isn't a gift unless it's something the person actually wants right so if we're just giving gifts because we feel the desire to give a gift but it's not something that really resonates with the person well then it's not a gift and it's so it's such an interesting way to flip it on its head so i usually end up being a lot more practical and a lot more like you, and not necessarily am I worried about you winning, but I am concerned about it being something that you will use, something that you will like. And and so it's I try and get into other people's head and understand what matters to them. Um, and sometimes, depending on who you are, it'll be something that you very specifically asked for. And all I had to do was you know, click checkout on the, on the website, which makes me feel lame. Right. I don't, and that's the word again. Um, I don't, I don't want to be that person. I want to be the person that's super creative, but those things, you know, it's a, it's a different way to invest time and energy, I guess. Yeah. Well, and I find it interesting because I was always as, as somebody who was receiving gifts, like when I was growing up, like I wanted that envelope to have cash in it. Like I wanted to be able to control my own fate, my own destiny. I didn't necessarily want somebody guessing what I wanted. It was just like, no, just give me an envelope of cash. Give me a gift card or whatever else. I remember being a kid and like my favorite gifts were always, and again, I don't know if this is associated with that drive to acquire, but it was like, I wanted uh, autonomy. I wanted to be in control of my destiny. Now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't some times when, you know, a family member would give me a gift and I was like, wow, spot on. That's exactly what I love. I remember uh, when I had gotten my tonsils out when I was very, very young and my oldest brother, Raymond, had bought me. And I don't remember what the toy is. I don't think it was necessarily something that was like it wasn't like G.I. Joe's. It was it was some kind of brand of robots I would have never seen. And, and it was just like, I remember being so excited about that. It was something new and just, you know, something that was right in my wheelhouse. So thank you for that gift, Raymond. I do appreciate it. Uh, with that being said, you know, I, I don't know if I adequately thanked him at the four-year-old, uh, four-year-old Jay Johnson, Mark, but I remember very clearly of when I got a gift of money and a lot of people feel really, really awkward about like giving a gift card or giving money. It was just like, now you've put me in the driver's seat of my own destiny. And I was super appreciative of that. Uh, but I think about that and like in turn, how I try to, for my nephews and nieces, I see them react very, very positively when they get a gift card. However, giving a gift card to adults or to your friends or to your partner or to whomever, it does kind of have a little bit of that, like, uh, yeah, thanks for the thought on this. But I guess that's that's that drive to just autonomy and unstructured. Um, do you experience something similar to that or how does that show up for you? So I, I, I will answer that in a minute. But when you started talking about being younger, I guess I was always relatively hard to purchase for. Um, I have a long history of getting a gift and taking the gift back and getting something else, right? So I I was that guy that would have always appreciated the money, but I was 12 years old. Uh, and some of you may remember the album Reach the Beach by the band The Fix. 
And I must have made such a big deal about this album because I got it on record. I got three different cassette tapes and I got their first album, which I think was Stand or Fall. Um, that's not it. But they, it, their first album on cassette. So I got five instances of the same gift between my birthday in November and Christmas time because I was such a pain in the butt to buy for. Uh, and, you know, anybody still have Reach the Beach? Because that's an amazing, amazing album. Um, so I like the idea of, of gift cards, especially to kids, right? Because I think ultimately anything that looks like or feels like money to them is going to bring a much brighter response than, you know, whatever ugly sweater we may pick out and think will suit their taste, you know. So I, I, I definitely see that with our own child when she was receiving. So those things are those things are great. And oh, my God, have they gotten so easy to purchase. And if you go in on Friday and have the app at Kroger, you get four times the fuel points, man. <laughs> Well, it's it's funny. It's funny you say that. So like when you brought up my I remember my mother was really, really difficult to buy for. She just I, I don't know what it was. No one knew what to get her. And one year she got uh, one of these like little snow babies. And she actually showed a little bit of joy in receiving that snow baby. And for the next 10 years, everyone got her a snow baby. She had like this massive collection before she died. And uh, it was just so funny because it wasn't it, it was maybe like 10 years later, she was like, yeah, I actually don't really like these things. I just I really liked that one. So you brought that up and I, I, I do find it funny. But she was she was also, I would say, very, very much a fire element. And um, I'm going to say lacking a little bit of sentimentality. And I've noticed that that is something that uh, I struggle with sometimes is that I don't have a lot of sentimental attachments to things. Um, and I don't know, I maybe associated that with my sort of lower water element, maybe my lower earth element, that structure, or uh, I'm not really sure where that comes from. So as somebody on that sort of opposite side, with you having that air and and the uh, and the water element, like, where do you fall or how do you think about things? Like, do you have a strong sense of sentimentality? Do you hold on to stuff that's given to you? Or is it more of just like the experience now and then awesome, it's locked here? Because I do remember all of these things. I'm not a monster. It is something that I'm appreciative of. It's just not something that the physical always uh, represents something I need. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And so I think it's partially because of, of different practices and different ideology around the construct of attachment and trying to be devoid of some of that. That said, if you were to go into my closet, it wouldn't take you terribly long to find my high school football jersey, practice jersey with my name on it. Right. And so, uh, you know, that thing's uh, probably old enough to be president of the United States at this point. And if it's not, it's real close. Um, but that's, I mean, that's about it, right? I'll go through the closet and I'll clean it out every six months, right? Because I'm a big fan of leaving space and creating space for new things to, to show up as opposed to holding on to clothes that I won't wear. Um, as I'm looking around here, you know, I, I've got some technology, um, that I probably should have gotten rid of a while ago, but I don't really know how to properly dispose of it because I don't clean hard drives. Um, I do have, uh, you know, way too many compact discs for someone that, you know, I'd have to literally sit down and think, where is a CD player and does it still work, right? So I've got 1,400 CDs that, you know, I'm like, I invested so much time and energy in the collecting, like they would never come up with a better idea than compact disc. Um, it's so silly. But yeah, I try not to and try not to be overly attached. I used to joke all the time, uh, you know, you're you're disturbing my feeling. So as a as a water guy, um, or as a high water guy, 
I I am not prototypical with a lot of the emotion stuff. Um, it's interesting though. My Myers Briggs flipped. I was an ENTP the first thirty years of my life, and sometime after having a kid, I flipped to an ENFP. Ooh. So, and I I that was I I found that remarkable, and we could talk about that later because that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, but I I loved uh, I love that 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 piece of of i don't know if that's maturing or not but you know it's they're borderline but it still shows up as an f so i uh sentimental is not and i don't get overly attached to cool things and i say that and then here's a coffee mug that my wife got me that's got the wedding song that we sang or not that we sang but that played during our first dance sitting right here on my desk in arm's reach Fair so enough. now you say ah call you out right ah <laughs> uh, yeah we're looking for any questions from the audience you can use the q and a feature i did see terry wade in here high water but that. not sentimental for physical things so yeah. uh, I'm guessing that based on the fact that you put physical into that space, that it's much more of like the uh, experiential things or maybe those emotional things or, or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a good distinction, right? The physical things versus the experience or anything else. I guess maybe I would have some sentimentality when it comes to uh, when it comes to like real experiences like trips or um, you know, shared moments or something of that nature. Because I have a really, like I said, I have a good memory as well, Terry. And like, I look back into those or anytime that I'm sort of reflecting on experiences, it's never really an object per se. It's much more of how did I feel at that moment? Or was there um, something that really sort of elevated? And I think that's one of the things that I maybe as a gift giver or as, you know, from that perspective, how do I show up or how do I bring things? I think I'm probably more along the lines of I do acts of service for people to tell them that I love them. Like I will be that person that will, uh, you know, pick up the, you know, pick up the tree and move it across your yard for you because that is uh, you know, that is something I'm, I'm giving you that time, I'm giving you that energy, and I want you to be happy and comfortable and do that. So I think I am much more of an act of service giver, uh, but more of an affirmation receiver, uh, or, you know, even a, even gifts to an extent, but I think that gifts have to be really kind of spot on. I want to go back to something, you know, from that water element. We know the water elements really got the strong drive to bond. And you said that one of your love languages is like time together. So when you're experiencing or maybe what would be some tips, you know, if you're thinking about like, all right, creating time or space together, what would that look like for you? And how do you maybe show up in that space of making sure that you're giving energy and time and effort and uh, those kind of like touch point experiences? What would you what would your recommendations be and how does that show up for you? Well, first and foremost, I think understanding how you show up and where you're coming from and what actually drives your behavior um, will help you show up more authentically, right? And so for me, you know, that that air is, I'm interested in experiences. I'm interested in learning new things. I'm interested in, uh, you know, kind of elevating a conversation, and so that, and, and obviously with the high water, I'm interested in forming some kind of bond. So leveraging that knowledge of self, um, you know, it's, it's real easy to slink back, especially, you know, we've been together 23 years. It's really easy to be like, okay, oh, what are we gonna watch tonight? In fact, a uh, billion dollar app idea, create, for these little listening spies, I'm holding up my phone for those of us not watching. Every time someone talks about a TV show or a movie, have that show up in their featured streaming service as something to watch next. It's a billion dollar idea. Let's get cracking on that. So, you know, the conversation of what are we going to watch uh, is now outpacing the what are we going to have for dinner 
And that's, that's like crazy time. So figuring out how to do something, you know, we were uh, building a puzzle together, playing games together. Um, and again, doing those things where, where we're together, we're not just staring at a TV or worrying about what the dogs are doing um, is really, really helpful. We le I learned how to cook. recently in the last couple of years uh and sometimes we'll do that together and sometimes uh and i and i think she probably likes us even more i'll just make the meal and bring it to the table and it's you know in the old days it was like oh you want me to cook well do you want spaghetti or mac and cheese or hot dogs and we started doing that home chef thing and It, man, they make it real easy. And, and that was, that was a really cool gift, um, it, which, you know, gave her free time to, to be able to do something new, right. And, or to work later or do whatever she wanted to do without having to be okay. Well, it's time to stop everything so I can make dinner, you know? So I, Those things I think are really, really helpful. And and for me, it was great because I learned something that I didn't think I was going to do. Um, and, and just the satisfaction that it provides her was totally worth it. Love it. So we are getting a bunch of questions and comments in the chat. I did get a notice that for some reason the chat function was not operational. I think I fixed that. So uh, audience participants, please feel free to weigh in. Curious, what is your primary element? If you've taken the free assessment on behavioralelements.com, you'll get that uh, primary element. What is your primary element? And please weigh in on any of these discussions. But let's take to Francesca's comment. I see it first and uh, one of our certified behavioral elements guides. So thoughts on how BE has any relation to your primary elements and secondary element can relate to how you show love and how that correlates to how you receive love. So I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna comment on this one. Uh, I had mentioned as a fire element and uh, I'm gonna pair this because I did see a comment down there. What are some of the best ways Uh, you know, at, as pure fire and water experts here, what would be the top three top of mind gifts for your element? So as a fire element, uh, something that I can immediately use or something that's immediately uh, useful to me uh, as an air element, something that generates my curiosity. And when I say generates curiosity, that doesn't mean like an Ikea box that I'm going to have to sit and put this thing together for six hours, that is going to kind of piss me off. <laughs> it's much more of like <laughs> a generating curiosity, like some kind of a puzzle or a game, something to get my brain moving or something unique that I've never experienced and have to figure out how to master it. So that would be something that would really, I guess, satisfy that drive to learn my air element as my secondary. Um, But the other thing that I would say with the fire element is something that raises status. And I know that that sounds, uh, I know that that sounds very um, egotistical, but something that raises status. So like a really nice uh, item, say, for example, um, I remember one of the really nice gifts that I got from uh, JCI Michigan was a watch and it was a Tissot watch, a Swedish watch. I remember they gave that to me at the end of my president term of JCI Michigan. And that was something that was really meaningful to me because I do like watches and that one happened to be like really elevated. So uh, that is a great example of, for me, something useful, something real time, something that does fall within my interest. I'm generally pretty easy to buy for as a, as a person because I do like a lot of things or I'm curious by a lot of things. But I would say from a fire slash air uh, perspective, it's definitely... useful, functional, right on time, instant gratification, and something that's going to make me a little bit curious, I would say is probably uh, how my two top two elements show up in receiving, uh, in giving. I think it's, I probably, there is probably a pretty strong correlation because I will do those same things uh, in order to help somebody or support somebody, but it's much more of I, I do think that I probably still fall into acts of service more so than I do actual gifts. Terry, your thoughts? So as a, as a water air guy, um, air water guy, I am a huge fan of experiences we can share together. 
right? So if it's a concert, if it's a trip, if it's a dinner, um, those things are all really, really interesting to me because it, it'll help us bond and, and get closer. Um, you know, occasionally, you know, you, you end up getting clothes and, and clothes are good because they, they elevate the appearance to what Jay was saying earlier. But those things that that we can we can go out and have a good time because I'm all about that experience or we can go and learn something new. Those things are and I like what you said about curious. Um, so when I think about gifts, my my wife's birthday is coming up and, you know, I was going to surprise her with a trip to Arizona to go see Dave Matthews band, which is our favorite band. Anybody got a thumbs up for DMB and go ahead and drop that in the comments. Right. Um, uh, but it was it was part of a road show like a like a festival. Right. So there were going to be 60 bands there. And I had a buddy that, down in Phoenix. He's like, just come stay with us. It'll be great. And, you know, we started looking at it. She's like, they're going to want to go see other bands. I don't give a crap about anybody else. I, you know, so we're going to we're going to end up skipping that. But that was, you know, a, an interesting, gifty sort of thing, again, that we could do together, go experience together. So I I love that that ability to bond. I also like what you said from a fire perspective of I want it now. We've got two trips planned and one of them is in three months and one of them is in 16 months. And she's highly focused in sharing reels and videos about the one we're doing in 16 months because it's a pretty expansive trip. Um, I could care less about that trip right now, man. I'm not thinking about that. I could be dead before that trip happens. I am focused on this one we're going on in three months because that's a that's a on the outside of my timeline that I can even pretend to focus on something. I'm like you, I'll I'll compartmentalize that stuff and I'll get back to it a year from now and really start digging into it then. Yeah, for sure. So thank you, Tracy. I saw that message. Um, you know, I'm going to touch on Stuart. He noted as a fire, the drive to acquire is real, but doesn't have that sentimental connection to physical possession. Now, here's the interesting thing with what you said, Stuart, and I, I tend to agree with this or I tend to kind of resonate with this. I see it pair so well with minuscule water and the drive to bond. I want to share what I have with people, specifically his whiskey collection. I'm kind of in the same way. Like I am, I very quickly will pick up a tab at a restaurant or very quickly invite somebody over and give them basically everything that I have or try to make them comfortable. So like sharing, interestingly, and you would think that that might not be associated with the drive to acquire, but when I really looked into this, and I can say this for me, on some level, I think that there is, and, and really digging in and doing some self-reflection, on some level, there is an element of status, right? Being a provider or being that uh, person that yeah, I might be a good hunter, but I'm also going to share with the tribe. And that can be a really powerful uh, leaning into not only the drive to acquire, because all four of the elements are always active in each of us in every decision that we make. And you could have been the best hunter, the best driven to acquire. But if you didn't have a tribe or if you didn't have any level of driven to bond, even if it is small, mine's also pretty low in the third position, but real close to that uh, earth element. If you don't have that sense, well, realistically, survival became pretty mute, moot for us uh, and our ancient ancestors. So I do see in many cases, fires can be very, very generous. And maybe it's driven a little bit by the drive to bond. Maybe it is driven a little bit by, because I got to I, I would be willing to bet, Stuart, is that when somebody sees a whiskey, when you say a whiskey collection, it's got to be something like, oh, my gosh, nice whiskey collection. And you're like, yeah. And you, you, you sort of have that sense of accomplishment that comes with that. So that can be something really powerfully driving some of those different behaviors as well. But I love it. Uh I see Heinz's comment. We have too many CDs and had to search hard to get our player repaired. Strong servant leader here, driven to help others and fully lived. Suggestions to ward off the abusers of your kindness. It's a great question. Terry, you want to take this? 
Man, you've probably seen the meme on Facebook that you've got to set limits on your giving because the takers don't have any. Um, so I'm a real big fan in the idea of I will help anyone once, right? You ask me for something, you're going to get it. You're going to get it right now. I just had an experience. Somebody I was interviewing to be on someone's podcast and the guy checked me out and said, oh, I see you have a book on networking. I just finished one. Do you want to trade books? No, I don't want to trade books. I already wrote a book on networking. I don't want to read one on it. Um, but that being said, yeah, sure. Here's my here's a copy of the ebook. I just I I'm rewriting that one. I don't have any physical copies. So there you go. You can have this and, and it's already done. Um, and, you know, so that's now we'll do a one to one and maybe he asked for something else and, and he'll probably get it because he seems like a nice guy. Um, but there comes a point in time when when you start to question whether or not someone's using you. Um, the answer is yes, and they have been for a while because you don't even notice it. Like a fish being in water, you don't know you're in water. And at some point, you either have to figure out how to ask politely for what you would like or need from them, or you need to say, listen, you know, uh, these are the things that people actually pay me for. I am happy to help you, but this is what that looks like. Um, I Years ago, I started to pick my brain. Uh, I had a pick my brain invoice, right? Because I got asked 10 times a week, hey, can I pick your brain? Uh, it got to the point where it was like nails on a chalkboard, man. No, no, you cannot. If you keep picking it, I won't have any left. <laughs> I like that. Well, and, and boundaries are something, and I actually think that this is a really good piece of advice for anybody in any kind of relationships of being able to navigate the boundaries and communicate what are the boundaries, you know, when we, and, and then sticking to those or adhering to them. Cause I will say this uh, in so often it is easy for me to slip into transactional mode of say giving or receiving any kind of love, whether that's in gifts, whether that's in service, you did something for me, I owe it to you to do something for you. And all of a sudden, you know, if, if you follow that mantra and people just start doing something for you, now you're going to feel these obligations to do something for everybody else. So if you're not able to set boundaries or to be able to navigate that, that can be really, really cumbersome or tiresome. And, you know, like I, I donate a lot of time, energy, resources to a number of different causes. And for me, when I think about the setting boundaries, it often is equated to uh, going back to something that you said, self-love. If I'm saying yes to this, I'm saying no to something else. If I'm buying a resource or giving a resource for this, that means I'm not buying or giving a resource for something else. So being able to kind of switch that mode of, sure, I could buy a trinket for this person or I could do something meaningful or longer term, I guess maybe is helping that that sort of mentality is help build some additional boundaries from my perspective, because I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, somebody can take advantage. Now, transactional gift giving or transactional affection is probably not always the best way to, uh, you know, navigate forward. So that's something that I've actually had to learn to kind of pull back from and more activate my drive to bond and create those more lasting and impactful relationships other, other than the tit for tat. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And I think you're I think you're spot on, especially in in affection and love. Transactional nature doesn't work. Right. In in to put a nail in the into the conversation Hein started. Um and you kind of alluded to it, Jay, you get to be in control of what you give, and you have to give yourself permission. Uh, to to exercise that control, right? We we in in I'm a dude through and through a giver. I it, 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 I have way too much history of giving. Um, if that could be a possible thing, I would have it. And I I learned that if you're spending so much time giving to others, um, the question really becomes 
because that is so out there in the ethers, right? Where we we end up giving to people we barely know. And you start to really quantify it and look, okay, well, I'm giving all this effort to all these people that I'm barely interrelated to or even speak with. Um, how am I doing with the people that are in my immediate circle? And equally, if not more important, how am I doing with myself, right? So it really, it, it once you invert that pyramid, right, give to yourself first, then you got all kinds of energy and opportunity to give to other people. But, it, and, I, and I see this with women a lot. Um, they're so busy giving to everybody else because it's in their nature. And quite frankly, the world would fall apart if they didn't. Um, but they, we need to have them taking care of themselves so they can do a better, well, uh, not a better job, but they can continue to take care of those they support. Right. I'm going to jump into, we've got an anonymous question here. Somebody whose behavioral elements has changed over the past year and the elements around them and the preferences and how they act, does that change over time? And when we think about the behavioral elements, think about it this way. Each of your elements is like a glass and your, your biggest element is your largest glass. That's where you're going to spend most of your energy, time, efforts. You know, we don't have longitudinal data long enough to say, okay, does Jay Johnson at 20, is it the same exact same as him at 40? Stay tuned. We're in some of those studies right now. Is it the same as at 60? But the reality is, is our neuroplasticity obviously is changing. So it's not uncommon. Generally, we don't see somebody go from being a high fire to all of a sudden and a very low earth, all of a sudden changing to a high earth and a low fire. We might see some shifts and we also don't necessarily know the effect of different traumas or life experience or epigenetics, right? So those things can have a huge impact from a science side. To your question, which I think is a fantastic one, to be a good partner is part of that paying attention to how your partner changes over time. I think the answer to that is yes. And if you were to ask 20 year old Jay Johnson, who maybe uh, wasn't established, didn't have the things that uh, I have now, I think gift giving would have been at the absolute top of my of my love languages. I would have, you know, it had been like, OK, well, I don't have things. I really, really want things. I think as I've gotten older and maybe been able to provide different things for myself, that becomes a little bit less in the scale. And now it's more of, say, the affirmations or the acts of service, things that seemingly have more meaning to me in that regard. Not to say that gifts don't. It's just a question of how those gifts are presented, received, or or shared, I guess I would say. Um I don't think you're an anomaly. I think that I think we all undergo these changes. But I mean, that's part of what we talk about with behavioral elements is our behaviors are a choice. They're driven by our thoughts and our feelings. But over time and experiences, we definitely get those new experiences that maybe give us more meaning to even past contexts and things like that. So, uh, Terry, do you have anything to weigh in on that as well? I, I see you might be typing on that one. I, I, I actually am, and I'll just say what I typed. I'm curious to find out whether the changes were gradual and or intentional. Did you get to a point where you were like, hey, you know what? This isn't really how I want to be. I'm going to do something different. Or was it like one day you just kind of woke up and you're like, whoa, I'm a, I'm a different person. I'm not even sure how or why that happened. Um, because that's a that's an interesting that's an interesting construct to me um, because, you know, as Jay has said about 87 bazillion times, uh, you know, behavior is a choice, right? So we get to choose how we show up. Um, and so did you choose to show up differently or did you just one day notice showing up differently? And, and I think, I think we end up being influenced by the people we spend the most time with. And so especially the people that we admire, right? You're like, ooh, you know what? I want to I want to be like that. And so maybe even subconsciously some of those decisions were made and you you begin to show up a little bit differently. But I I love that 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 change has has occurred and Jay alluded to the same thing, you know, gifts being a big thing in his younger years and changing as he as he aged a little bit. And I, you know, I, I think there's kind of a backlash 
on materialism in general at this point um, from a societal perspective, I've noticed anyway, um, or maybe it's just in my head. Uh, but it's it's one of those things that I think makes sense that we're like, OK, there's new and different ways to go about this uh, and, and still show up loving and caring and helpful and, you know, pragmatic, too. Absolutely. So, Terry, I'm going to ask you to take a look at Chris Campbell's uh, question on being a high water. I'm going to address the uh, the one just above that. Francesca's question for me is, how does a fire like you that has no sentimentality or emotional attachment to things do with receiving gifts in terms of BE? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, here's here's and let me maybe clarify on that question. I wouldn't say that I don't necessarily have any emotional attachment. I would just say that it's very, very, I, I, for me, it's very, very low. Um, but I'm also somebody who is very, very unstructured, right? Like, so my fire and my air are my primary elements. In the event that something goes wrong, say, and I've experienced this before, had a house fire, smoke went through the entire house, take the entirety of the house, shake it upside down, everything's gone. Um, they're going to try to clean it and get it back. A lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I couldn't handle that. I couldn't, I couldn't experience that. For me, it was just like, God, we'll get over that. Um, you know, there was certain things, whether it was, uh, you know, a, a trophy that I had or whatever else like that, it just didn't really occur to me that that was a big loss. I have those memories. Those things are really the memories and the experiences are what was really important to me. How I felt in those moments are really important to me. The actual materials are not necessarily something that I need in order to generate that sort of feeling or bring that feeling back into life. So it's very easy for me to not have, say, a particular sentiment. And I break things. And this is a known thing. Like, I, this is why we don't have nice things. That was created for me. I just have a habit of somehow or another being a savage and breaking different pieces. So I've gotten used to the idea of, I have it today. I have this espresso mug today. It may not be here tomorrow. And that's okay, because I'm still going to appreciate all of the experiences of this mug that I've had during that time. So um, in terms of in terms of some of that, <laughs> thank you, Emily, appreciate that. You know, uh, when we think about, um, when we think about maybe that secondary element being so high in the air and the fire and the other two being so low, I would say that, yeah, your secondary element plays a huge role. So that drive to bond, that intentional connection creation is probably more of a need. You know, if you are a water element and you do have that strong drive to bond, you're going to be looking for more of those, I guess, connected pieces it may not be a gift that matters to you but it is the experience or how that comes or who it comes from and i think you even commented on that a little bit lower in this space francesca so thank you for that question and putting me to the test there i definitely uh i definitely appreciate that terry kicking it over to you what do you think about chris's question i like chris's question because i run into this sometimes as a is a fairly high water and and my wife's a, a pretty high earth um and in some ways they like to receive information uh very differently than i like to give information and, and in water and fire have that same issue too right we're all kumbaya huggy touchy feely and they're like get to the damn point i got stuff to do so from my perspective i like the idea of trying to align what how you'd want to spend time with things that they'd enjoy too, right? If your drive is to bond and, and be together and do interesting things, well, then your best bet is to figure out what they might find is interesting. So, you know, maybe it's sports, maybe it's games, maybe it's, um, you know, learning things that are going to help them win more. But take some inventory and do it in a way that, that, express that it's important to you to spend time together and that you would like to know what 
things they would enjoy doing with you. So put the question on them. Uh, they'll probably not have an answer right away. And so give some space. They're either going to know instantly or it's going to take them like three days to get back to you. Those are the only two options because it's going to either be like this, 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 and this, or it's back burnered instantly. There's really kind of those two options. And Jay will speak more to that in a second. Um, but I like figuring out how to align those two drives because I have to align them in my own head all the time. My fire and water are both real close to a five on our scale. Um, and I'm like, okay, are you being fire? Or are you being water? Which one do you need to be in this exact moment? Um, so, but it's, it's that conversation. It's that communication. And quite frankly, it's the expressing of what's important to you um, without being overly demanding, because that'll just start a, another or a different argument, but making sure that it's clear, right? And concise. Oh my God, concise. <laughs> yeah. And Chris, I, and I'm going to echo what Terry said and do this in a non-intrusive way. And this is actually advice for anybody here, whatever your element is, look at what is preferenced, say, in somebody's space or in their car. And what I mean by that is look at their desk. What do they have front and center? What is standing out? What are the big pieces? You know, when they go towards uh, when they go towards grabbing their drinking glass, what kind of drinking glass do they have? Do they have a favorite? Is there something special about that? Look at the way that maybe they organize their closet. I know that these are all little tiny things and it seems weird, but what shirts, what sweaters do they have as their preference? If you start noticing these little behavioral patterns of what's first and then what's behind that and then what's behind that, you're gonna get a pretty good sense of what is a value or what's important. Because we tend to bring the things that are essential to us closer to us or easily accessible, whereas other things we may not necessarily make as accessible. So just do a quick you know, behavioral inventory of what are they highlighting, showcasing? Uh, in the case of Stuart, for example, my guess is that whiskey collection is probably front and center. If it's a beautiful whiskey collection, I want that out there. That's going to have meaning, right? So when we think about like what is out or what is out in front, that oftentimes will give us a pretty good indication of some of the things that really matter in terms of a gift. In terms of the way that it's structured, remember that a water element is much more looking for that sense of that drive to bond, that connection drive. Fire elements looking of how can I win? How can I get there? How can I do this quickly? How can I make a quick decision? So if, if I'm a water and one of the things that would really resonate with me is, hey, you know what? I made the decision. This is what we're doing for dinner tonight. This is what it looks like. This is where we're going. This is how it's functioning. Are you good with that? Yes. You just literally spoke my language because now it's a push forward with, all right, now I get a choice of yes or no, and I don't have to necessarily go the back and forth of X or Y or Z or what do you want or anything else. So even having some of that more communication that's matched or aligned with your partner's energy or with your partner's um, drives, that can be a really powerful way to signal an intention of love or compassion or consideration. So we are drawing really close. We actually got through all the different questions. Uh, but yeah, right. awesome, Emily. Thank you for the comment. Appreciate that. Glad you enjoyed. Really glad to have you here. Uh, I do want to ask, Terry, what is your final, if you were to give one final piece of advice for any of our audience here, what would it be on the elements of love? Go ahead, take it away. I think number one is figure out who your partner is and then have that conversation that explains who you are and commit to working together to you know blend those elements as harmoniously as humanly possible but it, it does it starts with that understanding and moves into that conversation and communication quickly awesome you know, I'm going to actually echo that, and it's something I probably wouldn't have said a long time ago, but actually engaging in the conversations and saying, hey, what do you like? What do you not like? What's the favorite gift I've ever got you? 
what's your least favorite gift I ever got you? And really exploring that and exploring it with a form of curiosity, not judgment, I think is a really powerful way for you to get to know those elements, but not just the elements of really what has significant meaning for your partner or for your family member or for whoever it is when you're navigating the elements of love. So I uh, want to say thank you so much for joining Terry and I here today for this Lunch and Learn. We are going to be doing this monthly, and uh, I, I just want to say thank you for your engagement, your comments, uh, the humor in the chat and the questions, and for being here with us. It's always something that's a lot of fun. Uh, if you have any ideas that you want to see us address or tackle, by all means, shoot us an email, connect with us on LinkedIn. Terry, what is your LinkedIn handle, just so that way people can find you nice and easy? Terry Bean or LinkedIn.com slash in slash Terry Bean. And just a quick plug in March, we're thinking about doing the elements drunk in honor of St. Patty's Day in <laughs> April. We're going to talk about the elements in Easter eggs in May. We're going to talk about the elements in tacos for Cinco de Mayo. We got this whole thing planned out, people. That's right. You can be assured that the two low earths, earths have no have everything scheduled and planned out. But again, thank you so much for being here. It has been really enjoyable. It is great to see some uh, familiar names and hope you're all doing well. Have a wonderful Valentine's Day. Until next time, we'll see you soon, friends. Behave intelligently.